Hi, I'm Carrie Schmidt, and this is Making Sense, a podcast produced by the Star Institute in an effort to further our commitment to impacting quality of life by developing and promoting best practices for sensory health and wellness through treatment, education, and research. Occupational therapy best practices ask us to integrate knowledge into practice. Each episode offers a different conversation aimed at translating the most current research into clinical action for occupational therapy practitioners. This season of Making Sense is sponsored by Calm Strips. Calm Strips began as a small piece of blue tape wrapped on the founder's finger. He looked a bit silly wearing the tape, not to mention he had a lone sticky finger at the end of the day. So then came the idea to create something that you could stick anywhere and take everywhere, you may need a little bit of calm. Calm Strips is unwaveringly dedicated to their mission to further destigmatize the need for support and help. Calm Strips, take a bit of calm with you everywhere. I'm joined today by Dr. Kiri Alvarado. Dr. Alvarado serves as the Chief Operating Officer for Autism Community Network which is a nonprofit in San Antonio, Texas, that provides autism diagnostic and peri-diagnostic support for children zero to six years of age. Carrie has a PhD in infant and early childhood development with an emphasis on infant mental health and developmental disorders. Dr. Alvarado was the first in the United States to become a Pediatric Autism Communication Therapy, PACT, accredited practitioner. Carrie is a DIR floor time certified expert clinician, and she serves as an assistant faculty for the Perfectum Foundation. Dr. Alvarado also serves as the lead for the Clinical Advisory Committee for the Star Institute in Colorado. Dr. Alvarado is passionate about building bridges where none yet exist, about innovating and expanding the boundaries of our knowledge, and about meeting families and fellow clinicians where they are and empowering them to find the gifts they all have to give. So in this series and in season two, um, I was really thinking about inviting people to talk about a topic that they're curious about and talk about how it contributes to overall sensory health and wellness. And as you know, at STAR, we're really passionate about evidence-based research. We're also passionate about Um, taking that evidence-based research and turning it into clinical action for occupational therapists. So when I propose that to you, tell me about the topic that came to mind and what you'd like to talk about today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I think increasingly, like you guys at STAR, I'm very interested in translational research. What are we learning about how to best support the clients that we work with? And I specifically work with clients on the autism spectrum. Generally, they're children six and under. Every once in a while, I get a little bit of an older child in therapy. Um, But I've increasingly become so curious about how to translate what we're finding in research um, in working with dyads impacted by autism and family systems impacted by autism. um, And and how do we best support them? Um, What are the different mechanisms that we use, interventionally speaking, Um, that seemed to make the biggest difference in the quality of their lives. And so today I really wanted to spend some time kind of unpacking the occupation of caregiver, you know, as occupational therapists and and thinking about sensory health, you know, we often just think about our clients. um, But I think increasingly as we're doing parent mediated work in OT and working with dyads, um, the parent and child combination, the the dyad really becomes our client. And so um, thinking about what that means for the occupation of parent or caregiver, um, how do we best kind of empower that occupation when we're working with um, dyads? I think that's great. I love that it takes into account both the evidence basis as we understand it and our role as occupational therapists, because it can feel overwhelming when we look at, um, there's a large body of research in autism, it has been a well-funded um, body of research, um, and it has um, touched um, this generation in a specific way, in a big way, an impactful way. Um, and so talk a little bit about the history. 
where have we, where did we start and kind of where have we come in research and autism and um, just kind of point us in the direction of like, not just where we are now, but where do you think that this is headed? Right. Well, it's, it's heading in an exciting direction, a little more slowly than those of us doing intervention would like. Um, but, you know, I think we've really ha- seen a strong pivot from focusing on the why autism happens, where does it come from, and just kind of focusing on those aspects of the, of the developmental difference. Now we're really pivoting toward, okay, so what interventional mechanisms are we using that actually really pack a punch, right? How do we support not only children who are impacted, but their caregivers as well? And how do we really ascertain that what we're doing, clinically speaking, is improving the quality of life for the family system? Um, there's been a, a large uptake, um, uptick in the number of studies that are now really focusing on more applied science, trans- translational science. So making sure that what we're seeing in a clinical research environment does translate over into everyday practice with families. Um, but the quality of the research is really kind of lacking, right? There are a lot of different intervention approaches out there that are specific to working with families. Um, I think the paper that we're going to discuss today actually really looks at about 34 of them. <laughs> that's a lot. Um, but the quality of some of the research that's out there, they, they kind of have um, low power. There's a lot of conflict of interest bias that's not being discussed. And so I think it's really important that we continue to work towards higher quality research studies that's translational and focused. That's really helping us as clinicians know that what we're doing with these families um, is really the most evidence-based um, as possible. I think that's great. And I, as a clinician, I'm always looking Um, for evidence. And sometimes when you're looking for evidence in a specific diagnostic category, as you said, you can go and look for evidence and it feels overwhelming because you're not quite sure um, what underlies that research and if it's rigorous enough and if it truly is going to point us in a a practical intervention um, direction. And I can imagine what it would be like also to have a family looking for evidence-based interventions Um, for their family member, for their loved one, it could be their child, it could be, um, you know, an adult in their family. I was really grateful for you to point me in the direction of a paper um, that you mentioned. We will include the reference in the um, show notes. Um, So if anybody is interested in reading this article themselves, um, the title of the article is Annual Research Review, The State of Autism Intervention Science, Progress, Target Psychological and Biological Mechanisms and Future Prospects. And it's by authors Green and Garg. So you mentioned in there just a little bit about the future of of research, but what I appreciated about this article was um, something else you mentioned, and that's that they are encompassing um, not just psychosocial mechanisms, but biological mechanisms. And they really are pointing us in the direction of um, considering the entire package, right? Taking our advances in science that we are enjoying and um, whether that's brain science research or, um, you know, understanding chemo reception a little bit better with medical interventions and really taking all of it and looking at how it all works together, right? How um, they could synergistically work together, the psychological Um, mechanisms to help us understand not just the state of the science, but where we could go with it. So again, we'll we'll include the reference for anybody that would like to to look that up, to read it. It's a really wonderful, very dense article. As you mentioned, it has, it really looks at the state of the science. It really looks at um, a number of interventions um, and that they're up for our consideration for their evidence basis and for their impact on families. So um, talk to me a little bit about the research around the parent-child diet specific to um, the impacts that we can make as occupational therapists um, in in that dyad um, in empowering the occupation of caregiver. So we know that different parent-mediated approaches where the caregiver is really empowered, 
and is enhanced with abilities to sensitively read and respond to the child's cues um, have shown significant benefit in autism intervention. Um, the approach that I can talk really more, most intelligently about would be DAR for a time and, and then PACT. Um, so we'll, we'll spend some time kind of unpacking that here in, in a little bit. Um, but I think that it's really unsurprising that we know when we support caregivers, the child has benefit because we know that really as early as six months in development, a lot of the caregivers are starting to pick up that there's something that's de developmentally a little different with this baby, right? Um, they're noticing that the baby isn't posturally attuning or orienting to them when they come into the room. They may not be getting those robust smiles paired with eye contact. Um, there may not be as much vocalization that's directed to the caregiver. And so the caregiver is attuned to this and adapts the way that they interact with the child from really very early on. Um, a lot of the families that we see in our diagnostic center, you know, come to us at age two and a half, three, and they say, hey, you know, I really noticed the differences in my child's development when he was just an infant. You know, he just didn't respond to me in the way that his brother or sister did. Or even sometimes if it's the first baby, they, didn't, they say, you know, it just didn't feel exactly like I expected it to. Um, and I went to my pediatrician and my pediatrician said, let's wait and see, right? We're still hearing that. Um, but I think that um, we know that if we can get in there and identify these early differences um, and work with parents very early on, we can help those adaptations that the caregiver makes to their baby who's developmentally different, kind of get back into a better rhythm and groove with the child, right? Um, so, um, we know that early brain development is transactional, it's experience expectant, and it's mutually influential. And when I say that, I mean that the baby is causing a shift in the way that the parent is interacting with them. Um, and the parent's interaction thus changes with the baby. Um, because that baby is not as responsive as they expect for them to be, sometimes what can happen is that elicits anxiety in the caregiver. Um, and they adapt because, you know, our, our brains are wired for social connection. Um, it's really ingrained in us as human beings that we're supposed to be socially connecting with one another. Um, and I think there's no stronger bond that we see that within them between a parent and a child, right? A parent and an infant. There's so much back and forth synchrony and social emotional cueing that should be going on. And the parents really feel when this is absent or when it's different. Um, so I think that we know that when we coach a parent to be as attuned to the child's cues as possible and to be as responsive as possible and to really understand their child's nervous system in a more robust way, it can help dampen down that caregiver's anxiety so that they can still continue to have that back and forth early, what we call proto-conversation or dialogue, that sort of pre-verbal dialogue with their child that we know will help the child's nervous system, regulation, attention span, and intentional communicative system really take on a lot more capacity as a child grows. Yeah, I hear so much there. Um, I am thinking about what you were talking about, about attunement. And I recently had the opportunity to teach um, a group of new moms a little bit about interoception, which is my passion, um, and why um, interoception, how it informs attunement and attachment. Um, and what I was hearing you say in part is to underscore the importance of it. Because when the child is not responding in the way the parent would expect, um, a lot of times I think it, it's natural to feel like maybe it's not important to that child mm -hmm. and to their development for us to practice that attunement, like maybe they don't have that need. Um, and so to, to talk to the, um, to the parents and um, underscore the importance of continued um, pursuit of the child's attention and, and um, continued responsiveness to their needs, um, despite the fact it doesn't appear important to the child. And um, so, I wanted to ask you, I can imagine maybe, maybe there's a parent that's listening who has a newborn and, and maybe they have some concerns. Maybe they have brought it up to a loved one or to, you know, to a 
um, to a pediatrician um, and they know in their heart of hearts that it, something's a little bit off or a little bit different. Um, maybe it's their first child, so they're not 100% sure whether it's with them or with the, you know, with the child. Um, I'd love to hear you uh, um, suggest kind of where they could go next mm -hmm. in terms of um, even asking for, for what is next. Um, right. for their child so that they could feel like, you know, they have um, been heard and are, are able to advocate maybe better for their situation. Right. And I love that word. I love that word advocate. Ad they become advocates, right? Um, I think, you know, a parent who's got those types of concerns, you know, often they do go to their pediatrician to talk about it. Sometimes they don't though, really early on, they think, oh, it's me, you know, it's just, I don't really know how to interact with this baby. Um, you know, it, sometimes it's, it's it, it can elicit some anxiety and some self-esteem issues for the parent, right? Um, so hopefully that parent's got enough um, family support around them to continue to persist a request a referral for an ECI evaluation or an evaluation with an occupational therapist. You know, I tend to be a bit biased as I am one, <laughs> but I always think that we are actually, we should be the first stop for these types of situations, right? Um, I think that, you know, we, our training really helps us um, to be kind of a great first line of support when a, ch a child is presenting differently in the way that they're experiencing their own bodies and the way that they're experiencing sensation and the ability to relate to the world around them and to their own selves because of those developmental differences. I think an occupational therapist could really help that parent kind of unpack what's going on with that child's nervous system and their sensory profile, their sensory processing capacities um, to figure out, you know, the root cause of why there might be some differences that we're seeing behaviorally and relationally, right? Um, but I think, you know, once that referral is made, it, it, it's incumbent on us as the occupational therapist to really understand that our role is not, again, not to only ascertain what's going on with that baby and how to support that baby, but to really look at the, the parent as our client as well. You know, um, I think we can play an imperative role in impacting parental sense of self and sense of agency. Um, and the interventions, especially in autism, that we know have the most impact are those that really do place the position of lead um, onto the caregiver, right? They, they are not only an important part of the equation, they are the essential part of the equation in helping children with autism develop on a different trajectory. Um, they are the experts in their own child. And so it's really important for us as the clinicians to embolden that sense of agency in, in the caregiver, just as we do in the children that we work with, right? It's really kind of a parallel process. So this is really important when we have a situation with where children have developmental differences, um, especially, you know, as significant as it can be in, in autism. Um, we have sort of a traditional, you know, pattern of intervention that parents have come to expect um, when it comes to, to helping their child, right? It, it's kind of that, um, you know, I'm going to bring my child to this expert guru clinician and drop them off. And, you know, my child's going to get quote unquote fixed right by this clinician. And I'm going to sit out in the lobby because I don't have anything that I can do to help this. Right. Um, unfortunately, I think that's still the prevalent traditional treatment model that's, that's happening at least here in the United States. Um, but I loved actually what, what Virginia brought up in a, in a, a past podcast that you guys did last season, you know, she talked about, you know, we, we don't want to be a laundromat, <laughs> you know, we don't want to be a place where a parent feels they bring their child and, and we're the experts in the child and we're the only ones that can institute significant change for that child. Actually, we want that parent to, to take that on. We want that parent to see themselves as that key agent of change. Um, you know, my, my, um, awareness of this really grew through my training in DIR floor time, you know, where we talk about the R and the, the power of the relationship. And, um, you know, the R could be us as the, the um, clinician working with the family, but really the most meaningful R, the, the, the driver, the, the vehicle for change that this child is going to take the long journey with is with the parent. And so if we can empower that parent to feel that they have the strategies they need to help their child, um, become more communicative, even non-verbally or verbally, to become better regulated, to be part of the social world more of the time, 
then um, we've made change that's going to really last. Yeah, and the message there really is um, for clinicians that this is a paradigm shift, that what this requires is a lot of humility on our parts. Um, and I love to tell the parents, you are the expert and I am here to guide you. I'm here to support you. I'm here to learn, help you learn what you need to learn um, to be the caregiver you want to be, um, to understand your child in the way that you want to understand them so that you can go out and advocate for them or so that the child can learn to advocate for themselves, depending kind of on the child's age. Um, and I heard a couple other things specific to occupational therapy. I mean, we do recognize and understand the complexity of the developmental pathways that support social transactions, right? That support social communication. But those of us who are um, sensitive to and trained in um, sensory um, integration or um, sensory health and wellness also understand if we under if we can look at the child's profile and at the caregiver's profile, we can find ways that we can help them match. Um, so it is important to consider, as you mentioned, the whole picture, because perhaps for that child, um, sound is noxious. Um, and so they're over responding. Um, we can teach the parents how to use affect instead of voice, um, how to lower the register of their voice, um, how to ensure that when they're interacting with their child, um, they're, they, they are not experiencing a lot of background or loud and sudden noises um, so that the child doesn't associate that interaction with some sort of background noise. Talking about associations, um, my daughter was um, a, a little over responsive with her auditory sense, um, sense. And we were in a car dealership um, in which they kept making really, really loud announcements um, over um, the loudspeaker. And um, we did take a car home that day and she wouldn't get in it for about a week because she thought it was the car <laughs> that was making those noises, right? Wow. Um, and so, the, you know, it's natural for their brains to make some associations. And, and I think occupational therapists are in particularly um, sensitive to the way that their sensation supports um, right. social interaction um, and the way that um, we can make ourselves aware of individual differences so that that dyad can be more successful. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you're exactly right. It, that the example that you gave with your daughter, you know, you just see her stamping that tag of a negative experience on on that encounter. And and but but I would mention too, you it sounds like you had a negative tag that was also associated, right? I think it, it it's so um, important for us to take into consideration the child's experience and how that association, that negative association also builds a negative association for the parent. Um, you know, when we're doing dyadic, dyadic work, we're having to really kind of reframe and help take off a, a negative association and put on a positive one into those sensory affective um, interactions that parents have between their children. Because so often, you know, they've encountered the child, they've tried to, to touch their child, they've tried to you know, sing to their child and all of these typical ways that a parent might interact and engage with their child has been skewed because the child's sensory integrative capacities are skewed, right? And so um, it's important for a parent to, to understand, you know, it's not that he doesn't love when you touch him, it's that he might need a different type of touch, you know, a deep pressure touch might be better accommodated to, you know, it's not that he doesn't want to listen to your voice um, but it's not that that register of pitch is, is noxious to him. And so if we really practice kind of dampening down our voices, maybe slowing down the rate of our speech, we can help that parent understand, oh, it's not me, right? It's it's not a, 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 a disconnect and an aversion to me as the parent. It's an aversion to that specific version of that sensory information. Um, and so that's where a therapist who's really understanding sensory affective integration, right? Where there's that sensory component, but also that emotional tag that came with it. Um, we can help to replace those emotional tags um, into, and into a more positive one. If we can just tweak that sensory information that's coming in a little bit. That's right. And whether that sensory information comes from me or is coming from the environment, right? I'm now more aware of it so that I can not take it quite so personally, um, but rather 
um, take it with a, a broad context of understanding and again, advocate in, um, a, a, you know, in a really informed way for the person that I love. Um, you know, this going back a little bit to the research in this article, um, they really are attempting to shine um, a light where it needs to be shown, right? That let's look at some consistent findings. Let's look at findings that are generalizable outside of um, kind of the, the one incident, right? Or the one specific environment or context. Um, and so talk a little bit about the interventions that are showing promise um, and how, um, how can we be more aware of them and learn more about them so that we can be um, evidence-based research informed clinicians. Right. Well, yeah, and that was really the piece that I loved. I loved the most about this research was that they really did dig in and they looked at all of these different kinds of interventions. You know, autism intervention research and autism interventions in general can be a bit tribalistic, <laughs> you know, and I think that the authors of this article described the, the world of this type of, of research is kind of chaotic, right? Um, but there are lots of different people who have lots of different interventions that they're studying and there are elements of truth to all of them. So uh, what I really appreciated about this article is, you know, that I thought, you know, John, John, uh, Professor Jonathan Green and his colleague Garg really looked at all the different um, evidence base that's existing and kind of extrapolated, okay, what, what, what are we all finding common in these interventions as, as really packing a punch and helping to change the tra trajectory for the families? Um, and so the, the couple of pieces that they really found at the forefront were enhancement of what they call proximal targets of intervention. So the proximal targets of intervention in dyadic therapy are really looking at what, what are we going to manipulate or shift within the parent in order to en enact change onto the dyadic interaction, which will then cascade into change within the child and the child's developmental capacities. Um, so the proximal targets impact are, you know, really improving parental responsivity and what they term synchrony. So the parent's ability to respond contingently, um, both from a temporal perspective. So if the child vocalizes, there's a vocalization that happens right away um, or, con you know, semantically contingent. So if the child is talking about ball we want to make sure that the caregiver is talking about the ball, right? So that there's um, an agreement and a shared meaning that's being supported by the caregiver's um, interaction with the child. I can just think of really practically speaking, it is sometimes really hard for adults to stay in that synchrony, to stay in that um, responding to, as you put it, semantically what's going on because we're always trying to level up the play or trying to direct it towards what's interesting to us. And that's just human nature, right? Because anybody who has sat on the floor playing with their child, sometimes time seems to slow down a bit, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I've got to answer that email. And I, what about the groceries today? What are we having for dinner? You know, what? I forgot to switch that load of laundry around. Did I call that person back? Um, and so staying in the moment, um, um, being um, sensitive to reacting in, in an appropriate time, um, but also, you know, as you mentioned, which is so important, um, reacting some, to specifically what the child is interested in and not what we're interested in or the qualities we're interested in about that object or um, about the play theme um, that the child is introducing. And this um, is work. It can be work, right? But it's really important work. And I think I, just a really simple tool that I have found in the clinic that really has helped parents um, and certainly has helped me is um, the improv tool of yes and. And so just starting with that with them, if they are stuck in understanding how to play, just asking them to say yes and adding on um, because it helps them to stay in the moment and it helps with that time sensitivity and it helps um, with uh, staying on the semantic, um, I guess, pathway that the child is leading us down. Right, exactly, exactly. I love that. I, that's a great strategy for in vivo coaching. You know, one of the pieces that is really unique to PACS um, uh, is, is the use of reflective video feedback. 
And so when I have a, a family, um, historically, when I've had a family who's had that difficult time and kind of staying present in the moment with the child, um, PACT really kind of takes that out of the equation, right? Um, because what it does is it uses video. Um, and when you're the clinician using PACT intervention, um, you actually sit with the parent, you know, distant from the actual interaction with the child and you're using that video as the tool. So that allows the parent to kind of zoom out and think a bit more reflectively because they're in a safer space, right? They're sitting next to you, they're grounded, they're able to attend, they've got that shared video right in front of you. And you can really have that parent then lead you back to those moments where they were feeling successful and then learn how to unpack why, right? What were the strategies that you were using to add? that really afforded your son that, that beautiful ability to reference you, to share that, you know, that, that positive affect with you, that shared smile. Um, why did he point to show you something there? Um, what were you doing from a pacing perspective or from um, an imitative perspective or from a using simple language models perspective that allowed him to have that moment of interactive success? How did that feel for you? Right. When we're in that protected, safe zone of having the video in front of us and it's not an in vivo conversation that we're kind of trying to guide, you know, in live in live interaction. I think it affords that parent a better sense of regulation and stability, um, which affords them the ability to be a, a bit more attentive and attuned to themselves in the moment, as well as what their child is bringing to the table, interactively speaking. I love that because one of the things that that beautifully does is some of the interventions that parents are introduced to are highly measurable, Mm -hmm. but they're not meaningful. And so what you're doing there is you're saying, let's look at this interaction. How is that meaningful to you? Right? Like where was that successful? Um, Where did that resonate within you? Um, So that next time um, we can um, design, you know, an interaction again, that's super meaningful to the both of you. So talk about that difference. Like how do we capture, whether it's with goal setting or, um, with just our parent education, with the reflective feedback, um, tools, how do we shift our focus away from what we're learning might, um, have not been very helpful, um, and that is super measurable um, interactions or, or outcomes of interactions, and shift it a little bit more towards what the research is pointing us towards, which is meaning matters. It matters if it's meaningful. Right. And that really leads us into a larger conversation about who decides what's meaningful, right, in, in, in the intervention itself. Um, you know, when we're working with dyads um, and we're, we're working with children who are very young, who don't yet have their kind of own voice and ability to tell us what their goals are, right? Um, the goals often come from the caregiver and what's meaningful to the caregiver. And so a lot of our work when we're working very early on is helping that caregiver understand what are the the shifts that we can make interactively that are going to really promote a better quality of life for your child and for you, for your whole family system, really, right? Um, So often I work with caregivers right before or immediately following the diagnosis. So we do a lot of peri-diagnostic support. Um, And so we're, we're, we're working with caregivers who have a lot of anxiety Um, you know, there's a lot of trepidation about what's about to happen or what the information they've just received. Um, and, and that can really be driving what their goals are then initially, right? Um, you know, if the child is engaging in self-stimulatory behavior, well, please make that stop. That causes the parent a lot of anxiety. Um, if the child is scripting, please make that stop. You know, that, that's, um, I think when those behaviors occur, that's autism and that really can paralyze a lot of parents and cause them to just kind of shut down interactively versus what we need them to do, which is really ramp up their ability to get that child interacting to a level that they're comfortable with, right? And so a lot of what we're doing in our early work with caregivers is really unpacking, you know, what, what is your child needing? Um, what is what is the function of that behavior for your child? If, 
if your child is, you know, flapping their little hands, is that actually demonstrating a positive emotional response, you know? Um, or is that child um, engaging in lots of hopping because there's a little bit too much stimulation going into their little cup right now? And if we just, you know, kind of modify our pacing a bit, we might see that that child's better able to stay regulated and attentive with us. Um, and so it's really kind of having those conversations. And, and like I said, in PACT, we would use that video footage to have that conversation around where we would say, you know, you know, I, I hear you saying that a goal for you might be to have your child not engage in that behavior. Let's talk about why, where's that coming from for you? You know, what are you feeling when you see your child flap his little hands? Or what are you feeling when your child is using script? And how um, is that helping the interactive process when you stop it? Or how might that actually be encumbering your child from being able to communicate something they're interested in with you? Um, and so the goals and, and what's meaningful to the family can be kind of helped um, facilitated through our intervention so that we keep the eye on the prize of what is going to be meaningful to the child as they get older. And that is, you know, I can stay in a regulated, safe state when I'm in interaction with another person. Rela relationships are positive and meaningful to me, and I can feel successful within them. Um, I can feel successful and empowered as a communicator and I expect my voice to be responded to. I can lead an interaction and sequence it together um, and have a successful outcome that somebody else really enjoys as well. Um, and so these are the kinds of conversations that we have with parents very early on when the child isn't able to, you know, like I said, you know, tell us what's meaningful to you. And these conversations, um, these quality of life skills that we are trying to kind of instill into this family system, those are informed by our autistic adults, you know, that are out there now working as advocates who have encountered different types of interventions in their past that might have, you know, squelched their ability to self-express um, that might have even caused a little bit of trauma for them, right? Um, and so we certainly try to be very aware of, you know, what the autistic adult community is telling us um, is helpful to them. You know, they want to feel safe in their own bodies and they want to feel connected and successful in relationships. Um, and so we kind of start from the bottom up when we're working with very young children and their parents in helping to craft that message um, so that we have children who, as they grow, understand um, the importance of relationship and feel successful in relationship um, and that that success will then extend to other people in their lives as they grow older. Thank you for saying that because while we did focus on an article that looks um, at interventions is looking for rigor and evidence, mm -hmm. we really value looking at other perspectives too. We listen to advocates even to parents of grown children with autism, um, it's important to in, understand not just what we're finding out quantitatively, but what we're finding out qualitatively makes a difference for these um, children, <laughs> adolescents, adults, caregivers. Um, and so we, I want that message to be loud and clear, like we value feedback um, from every direction so that we can improve. Yes, we care about the evidence, but yes, we care about the people who've been impacted um, and we, we value their voices. So thank you for saying that because it's a super important point. We want to make sure everybody feels included and valued and heard because it's so, we, we appreciate it so much. Right. And I do think it's important for us to also, you know, talk about it's not necessarily an either or situation. It's um, what are the, the mechanisms for change that developmental and relational approaches bring to the table that are actually going to enhance those qualitative aspects of that child and that caregiver's life together, right? Um, so when we're talking about really helping parents become um, better at following their child's lead and more synchronous in the way that they respond so that that child feels safe and organized in interactions, um, we're really helping pave the way for a better relational trajectory for that child and that, that family moving forward. And that was the message, one of the messages that I took from this article, right? Like 
this is where we have come from, but there's a lot of hope for the future um, in not just our ability to um, research, but our ability to um, learn about um, something we haven't talked a ton about today, but is on the horizon, which is biological interventions, um, you know, and how we can understand um, using biological interventions to boost um, psychosocial um, interactions. And so um, I'm excited about the future um, and what it has to hold. What is one thing you're excited when you see this research, when you see people talking about the future of intervention? What's one thing that strikes you? Um, so the article really talks about, you know, kind of, again, bridging psychosocial approaches with biological interventions that seem to be kind of catching some attention lately in research. Um, I, I've been really interested in oxytocin studies that have been coming out. You know, there, there have been several, they haven't really shown a lot of benefit yet, um, but I am hopeful that there might be um, a future where we can work with the child with a psychosocial intervention, um, PACT or DIR or, you know, another and, and we would have a child whose kind of baseline has been elevated because they're getting neurochemically a little bit more of what they need to be stable, right? Um, so I think that, you know, some of the biological um, interventions that are mentioned in this article are really around oxytocin. Um, they're around looking at um, glutamate and the EEG studies that are starting to come out. Really, really interesting to think about how our interventions are shaping um, both the neurochemical and the neurophysiological, um, you know, uh, presence or, or structure even of the child's brain. Um, I think it's really interesting to think about SSRIs and different types of biologics that are being used. Um, not that we're going to be ever prescribing them to the children, but we are, we are the front line. Um, we can have those conversations with families around, okay, now your child is taking an SSRI what are um, some of the things that you're noticing? Are you noticing enhancements in regulation or attention? Or are you noticing that now the child seems more irritable, isn't sleeping well? Um, those are things, you know, it's really important for us to understand and to be um, very aware of these new biological interventions that can help us um, in charting um, in making more impactful progressions with the children and the families we're working with. No, I love that. This article is so rich. And if you love research, I would highly recommend that you go look at it. But one of the things that the authors did at the very end, which I thought was, was really helpful. And um, after reading through pretty dense um, results and research and discussion, they did a really nice thing in the final conclusion, and they just talked a little bit about what are some approaches in autism intervention um, that we could take away um, in terms of clinical action that we could um, in, keep in the forefront um, when we're thinking and talking about intervention. And they listed four, and you have one to add. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read what they listed. And then I'd love for you to talk about the one P that you would add. Um, okay. They really asked us to consider involve, um, involving a participatory approach, which I think we talked about today, right? Understanding the diet, understanding social connection, understanding um, the importance of staying in the moment and participating. They talked about a personalized approach um, in which we really, really look at the features and attributes of the nervous system of the person in front of us, um, both the caregiver and the child. Um, they talked about a predictive approach. Um, and so really understanding the intervention um, effects downstream, um, things that change um, as a result of um, developmental science, for example. And then they did talk about a preemptive approach um, and that is, as you spoke about, the importance of timeliness of intervention. Um, and so what was the one P that you would add to that? Um, the, the last P I would add would be positive, right? Let's, let's make sure that our interventions are very strengths-based in working with both children and with the parents that we're supporting. That's one of the things I love about DIR floor time, one of the things I love about PACS. Um, it's really about 
finding those moments of success and building on those, um, shining the light on the gifts that the child has, the gifts that the caregiver already has, and they're bringing to the interaction um, about relational successes that we're seeing already. And then we can kind of focus on what we want to grow more of, right? Um, and I really think, too, that this P, this final P of positive should also um, take us into perspective as the clinicians, right? Um, so I think that's really important that we um, are kind to ourselves as we're kind of charting through this new territory, working with this really um, challenged um, subsection of children and, and families. Um, I think that we are all inquisitive and compassionate pioneers. Um, there's so much that we're still learning. There's new research coming out every day. It can feel impossible to kind of stay on top of all of it. Um, so I think it's really important that we also um, are positive and supportive and kind to ourselves as clinicians um, and that we're keeping our own cups full enough um, to support, you know, a family system that's going through something that um, can be a, can be a kind of a scary journey if they don't have, you know, the right supports around them. I love that. Thank you for saying that. Um, you talked about valuing that the science is evolving, valuing that we need to ask questions and that we need to um, pay attention to the way that not just science, but society is evolving. Um, and this means sometimes we have to change our minds about something, or sometimes our thinking has to evolve right along with science and um, society. And so I would love for you to, to tell me one thing that you once believed that you have either changed your mind about or that your thinking has evolved on. Wonderful question, I love it, thank you. Um, I would say for me, I really have become increasingly aware that in order to promote change um, in the families that we're working with, that's sustainable, that's generalizable, um, that we really need to kind of become increasingly distal um, and work with families. So, um, you know, early in my career, um, I was lucky enough to get DIR floor time training, which made me much more aware of the power of the relationship between the caregiver and the child when working in pediatrics. Um, I've become increasingly aware that in order to institute changes in dynamic family systems that last, that are sustained, and that generalize, generalize to other people, that I need to, as a clinician, become, um, help them be, help them develop skills that are as internalized as possible. Um, and the best way that I found to do this is through reflective video feedback in, in my interventions. Um, so this really means that I increasingly have learned that I need to play a more distal role um, as early as possible when I'm working with dyads. Um, I've learned that just as we follow the child's lead and we, super we supercharge child agency, it's also our job to supercharge that parental sense of agency um, so that they feel that they can have an impact for their child. Um, if I'm successful in boosting the caregiver's sense of agency and helping them reframe their autistic child into somebody they understand and feel successful in connecting with, um, we win the long game. Um, you know, I, I think that when we can help the parent understand that they can become the child's advocate for life until that child is able to become an advocate for themselves, um, that we've done our job, right? Um, so I want the family's success to belong to the family increasingly. And I think I want them to know that they alone already have all the tools they need to be successful in supporting their child and into having a happy and a healthy life. Um, I'm just there to kind of polish those skills that they already have a little and to help them learn to believe in themselves and the impact that they can have on their child's um, life. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for being the type of clinician that is not just compassionate, but really focused on empowering people um, in their particular roles in life, in their occupations. That is, as you mentioned, the long game of occupational therapy. That is who we are and what we care about. And so thank you for being that type of clinician. As Dr. Um, Miller 
um, the founder of Star used to tell us, give away the magic moments. And that's exactly what you were saying. Give away the magic moments to the families because that's where it matters. So thank you. Thank you for giving away the magic moments. Um, and thank you for giving you, giving me your time today, giving us all this important conversation. If people loved what they heard and would like to connect or learn more about PACT or learn more about DIR floor time, Perfectum, um, your work, where would I direct them? Um, so people can reach out to me at carrie at acn-sa.org. Um, I'm usually really um, best on email. I can I can get back to you with a better um, response that way. So I would love to hear from clinicians who are doing similar work or parents who are finding that they're having a hard time finding this kind of support for their child or anybody who's just interested in learning more about, um, you know, contemporary dyadic practice as an occupational therapist. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to have that conversation anytime. So thanks so much for having me today. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And we will include your email in the show notes. Um, right. So if you're driving or um, listening in some way <laughs> that you couldn't write that down, um, it will be there. Well, thank you so much for being here today. I truly appreciate it. Of course. Thanks for having me. It was fun. You can find me, Carrie Schmidt, on Instagram at Carrie Schmidt OTD. That's C A R R I E S C H M I T T O T D. The Star Institute is a nonprofit organization. You can find out more about us at our website, sensoryhealth.org. That's www.sensoryhealth.org. There you can join our email list, find out about our educational, clinical, and research endeavors, and make a donation. This podcast wouldn't be possible without our wonderful guests and the support from the Star Institute, especially Crystal Hayes and Tori Pluchek. Your feedback matters to us. Please leave a review, subscribe, and share this podcast with your friends. This is Making Sense. I'm Carrie Schmidt.